remember February? Mm. Seems like a lifetime ago. Um, in late February, coronavirus had been found in three dozen countries around the world. About 80,000 people were infected worldwide. Less than 3,000 people had died. On February 25th, a senior officer at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, Dr. Nancy Messonnier, um, came right out and said it, said what was going to happen in this country. She said in a telephone briefing with reporters that a coronavirus outbreak in this country was inevitable. It was not a matter of if, but when. And she said that, quote, disruption to everyday life might be severe, that it was time to start having tough talks within our families and our communities. The kind of tough talk she said that she herself was starting to have, including about closing schools, closing businesses, reorienting businesses to operate remotely, all the stuff that is now just our new version of regular life. Uh, that night, after that shocking briefing uh, from that CDC official in February, I was joined on this show by Pulitzer Prize winning uh, science journalist Lori Garrett, who spent three decades covering infectious disease outbreaks all over the world. And I asked Laura Garrett about what we had just heard from the CDC, um, this sudden and suddenly dire warning from this CDC official. Um, you know, it was back at a time when we had a CDC that was allowed to speak to the public, but ne Dr. Nancy Messonnier's warning was, was shocking at the time. This is what Lori Garrett had to say about that. Again, this was February. Check this out. Do you feel like um, the U.S. government is, is sort of timing those kinds of public alerts correctly? Is, are, are we past due for that sort of thing? Is, that, is it possible that it could cause an overreaction at this point? It's long overdue. We should have been ready already, <laughs> and we're not. Every single company that has more than a handful of employees should have a, an epidemic plan in place. Do you have a way so that your workers can work remotely and not come in, not congregate, not infect others in the workplace. Every school, every university should be looking at how to have more and more of the coursework be handled remotely. And we don't have enough protective gears uh, stockpiled or available in, in inventory to supply all those personnel in the United States right now. Today, Rachel, in, in Geneva, they held a press briefing that went on and on and on, almost an hour and a half long, and it featured leaders of this team that had gone into China to investigate what's the status of the situation right now. And they said in no uncertain terms, everybody should do what China did. Well now, can you imagine? We're gonna shut down 100 million Americans? We're gonna shut every business in America? It's February 25th. You can see how long that was, long ago that was, in part by how close I was sitting to Lori Garrett when we had that conversation. The idea that America would need to shift to those kinds of responses at that point was mind-blowing. But you know, uh, being right is, is one thing. Being right in advance when nobody else can see it and it sounds like what you're saying is science fiction, that's not just a blessing, that's a national resource. That is somebody worth listening to and going back to. Uh, joining us now is Lori Garrett. She's a health policy, policy analyst, Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist. Uh, Lori, I really appreciate you making time to come back tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm grateful in, I was grateful at the time, I'm grateful in retrospect for how loud you were um, about what was coming, even when nobody else was talking in the terms that you were talking. Um, I have to ask you, I sort of just, I don't want to guide you too much, I want to ask you big picture where you think we are right now. I feel very concerned about the number of states where the case numbers and the hospitalization numbers are, are rising every day now. How do you feel about, about where we are, uh, particularly this many months into it? I think we're in terrible shape. Um, I think that the reproductive rate of the epidemic, meaning the rate at which any one individual is likely to infect another individual, is well above one, which means that it's still growing. It may not be growing at the astronomical rates that were occurring in March, but it is still growing. We haven't snuffed it out. And in certain communities, it's growing very frighteningly fast. In fact, one of the communities where you can see a graph that just suddenly in the last seven days went is Tulsa, Oklahoma, where the president will be holding a campaign rally uh, very soon. And that rate of growth, that sudden surge, 
while the absolute numbers may be small because the population is enormous, uh, that level of curve is really, really indicative of an out of control situation. Um, and we can see in isolated communities all over the United States a similar trend. Meanwhile, you know, when we talked back in February, we thought, I thought that we were on the cusp of a truly global pandemic. We now not only are beyond the cusp, we're fully into it, and the Southern Hemisphere is now raging uh, as they go into their winter. So now every single one of the sort of um, second tier economies, the so-called BRICS economies, every single one of them has a giant epidemic going on right now. India, uh, you know, uh, South Africa, Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, go down the list. Meanwhile, in Europe, while they seem to have uh, generally declines in most of Europe, with the UK still very much struggling, the economic impact is absolutely staggering. A new report just out this week from the uh, OECD, which is basically the financial club of the richest countries on earth, um, estimates that uh, every single country in Europe, in every single country in the OECD is going to see a negative GDP. So their economies are going to be going backwards. And in some of them, it's really bad. I mean, the UK, France, Italy are going to be approaching negative 15% GDP. I mean, that's Great Depression. That's, that's staggering. Staggering. Um, you know, we were, after 2008, we were gasping because we were down to only positive 1% growth. Well, now they're predicting for the United States negative 8.5%. Um, you know, to put this in perspective, Rachel, the, the worst case scenario pandemic plan that I saw last year said, gee, if it got really bad, we might have negative 4% GDP in the world. Well. Just this week, the World Bank predicted the entire global economy, every single country on Earth collectively is going into a negative 5.2% GDP. So that's 5.2% of the wealth of the planet just shrinks. And amidst all of that, we have pandemic. And it's not just miraculously going to stop. It's not miraculously going away. And here in the United States, we just have no national policy. We have no consistent strategy across the nation. There's no guidance coming to uh, states in any coherent way from the CDC. They've essentially been quieted. And the whole entire stock market has been hanging by its fingernails until today when reality started to set in, thinking, okay, we've got to have a vaccine. We've got to have a vaccine. And that's going to get us out of this. That's going to get, we've got to have a vaccine. Well, what, Rachel, happens if either one of the frontline vaccines doesn't work properly, or it gives a very weak immune response that's not truly protective, or worse yet, it actually causes a negative side effect. Then what does the market do? Wow. I mean, stand back and watch your dust settle. Lori, in terms of the um, options that we have as a country, you just said that we have basically no national policy and no coherent advice. I mean, we've seen the failures in terms of the CDC as a world-class organization um, become what it is right now. We've seen the White House leadership on this evaporate to a large extent. I mean, to the extent that it was wrong-headed, it's now just gone. We do see states sort of running around like chickens with their heads cut off, not knowing what to do. My question for you is this. As we see, you know, 83% hospital usage already in Arizona with the numbers still going up. As we see Texas, 42% rise in hospitalizations since Memorial Day. As we see Arkansas even worse than Texas along those lines. So we see the sort of strain that we're going to see on healthcare systems as this epidemic just does its thing. Do we have options for trying to respond in ways that are coherent and that will make a difference? that are along the same lines as the options that we had in February and March, or have some of our options evaporated because our epidemic is mature and large now. And so therefore, we can't do some of the things we might have otherwise done when it was in an earlier stage. I think our options for much of the country have indeed shrunk. Here in New York, where I am seated right now, um, we have brought this epidemic down to um, 
a, a really manageable, almost victorious level after more than eight weeks of the entire city being under shutdown uh, and a tremendous amount of sacrifice and hard work by literally tens of thousands of people. That needs to be mirrored around the country before, and by the way, we're only like gingerly going into phase one of opening this week. There are parts of the country that have never been on full lockdown, never brought their numbers down for any consistent period of time, and they're already going into phase three opening, meaning just about everything is gonna be open. Almost every kind of retail operation, almost all sorts of service operations, uh, uh, even reopening uh, travel uh, across uh, state lines and so on. I mean, this is just irrational. And I think, you know, here in New York, you're going to hit a point where you're gonna hear hue and cry from people who sacrifice so much, including their jobs and their kids going to school all these weeks. And now what, a traveler's gonna come from Florida where those restrictions have all been lifted and reintroduce COVID to New York? Oh, how do you think New Yorkers will feel about that? You see, here's where the insanity is. We don't have a national strategy, Rachel. So what's going to happen as this evolves over the summer and the disappointment gets worse, the weather gets warmer, people really want to be at the beach, they want to be out and seeing one another, they're fed up with being under lockdown, you're going to start to see more and more animosity between states, more and more tension uh, within states across counties that have low levels versus counties with skyrocketing levels. Um, the kind of solidarity that is absolutely essential to conquering a disease like this is evaporating very fast before our eyes. And you know, just to remind you, because some of your uh, audience may not have even been, you know, adult and paying attention when uh, H1N1 exploded, the swine flu in 2009. But to put that in perspective, the CDC was fully in charge and did at least one full-born press briefing every single day and did briefings for governors. Every day did briefings for state health leaders, county health leaders. The level of engagement was enormous and the degree to which all of us look to Atlanta to hear what's the latest, what advice are you giving us, was absolute. The result was that we had consistent policies across all 50 states and the territories. We knew what supplies everybody needed. We knew what vaccines everybody was going to get. We don't have any of that now. Laura Garrett, health policy analyst, Pulitzer Prize winning science journalist, um, person from whom I learn something new every time I talk to you. Uh, Lori, thank you. It's terrible, it's terrible news, um, but thank you for your clarity. I appreciate you being here. Thank you, Rich. All right, much more to come tonight, Stephen.